Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, a couple of years ago, I, I, had, I had the coolest tweet in the world that day. So what happened was, uh, the, the tweet was this. The tweet was, with Dalai Lama, uh, it, behind, or behind Dalai Lama, a buffet line. So what happened was this. Uh, we, were we were having lunch, a buffet lunch, and the Dalai Lama was supposed to come and speak for a couple of minutes, and he was supposed to leave. He wasn't supposed to eat there. And because he wasn't supposed to eat there, it was a buffet lunch. Right? I mean, if he was supposed to eat there, it would have been a formal lunch. So it's kind of a buffet lunch. And then he came, he came slightly early, and then he decided he wanted to eat there. And we were all like, oh my god, right? we kind of started panicking. Uh, and then uh, I was already at the head of the buffet line. It was almost good. I was at the table, and then I saw him climbing from a distance. And he was going to like, stand. He was going to join the line, and we were like, no, you're holding this, you, you get to cut in. So he got to cut in right in front of me, and I was like, there was, that's me, like, at the buffet line with the Dalai Lama. <laughs> it was very funny. <laughs> so I, tw I tweeted it. Yeah, best tweet in the world that day. <laughs> so somebody asked me, what did the Dalai Lama get for himself? I said, he's the Dalai Lama. He made himself one with everything. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> True story. <laughs> <laughs> so the Dalai Lama, as I got to know him, I also found something else about him, which is that, uh, like his public image, by the way, the, the, the Dalai Lama you see in public is the same guy you see in private, which is he's very, very smart, he's very funny, and sometimes he's a little bit mischievous. <laughs> so the example of his mis mischievous, uh, uh, one time he was giving an interview, and somebody asked him, they said, Your Holiness, what is the happiest moment in your life? And His Holiness said, right now. <laughs> and then, of course, he gave that, that, that mischievous smile. <laughs> right now. So, I mean, in, in the case, in, in a sense, it's a joke. He's telling a joke. But in a sense, very importantly, he was making a point. And the point he was making is that for a highly trained mind, right now, is or can always be the happiest moment in your life. Right now. Right, joy on demand. The key word is highly trained. So the key to that, the key to, between uh, the Dalai Lama and the rest of us is training. Maybe I'll tell another joke. So a Chinese guy went to, went, to, uh, went to a fortune teller. Fortune teller looked at his palm and said, you know what, you are miserable right now and you will continue to suffer misery until you turn 40. And Chinese guy, yes, after I turn 40, when well, my misery finally go away. <laughs> and and fortune teller say, no, after you turn 40, you get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that's like, for many people's lives, it's like, it's like that. <laughs> the good news is that, I mean, looking at the Dalai Lama story, I think even my own story, is that it doesn't have to be that way. It turns out that access to joy is a skill. And because all skills are trainable, right? So if access to joy is a skill, it also must be trainable. And in my life experience, I found it to be true. Because when I was young, I used to be miserable. I used to be the guy in the second story. Right? And then almost by accident, I found Buddhism, I found meditation, and then I started meditating. And by the time I was, uh, by the time I came to America, came to America, I joined, I joined a small company called Google. It kind of became, it became quite successful. It was, it, was, it was a fairly big company after I joined. Uh, so even by the time I joined Google, I was like, I was a jolly man. And, and my job title in Google was the Jolly Good Fellow. Right? Because I was known as the guy who's always happy. Jolly Good Fellow, which nobody can deny. That was my full job title. <laughs> <laughs> With parentheses, which nobody can deny. It was very funny. Started as a joke, by the way. <laughs> Until I ended up on the front page of the New York Times, and then you know, I got stuck with it. <laughs> so it might, for me, my life experience was the same thing, training. I, I realized that uh, when I was young, my baseline happiness, so there's this concept of baseline happiness, which is your happiness level, uh, if, you're, if you're something good happened to you, you go back, eventually go back to that baseline. If something bad happens, go back to the baseline. The baseline is more or less fairly stable. And I found my, and scientifically, for a long time, uh, scientists believe that the baseline is unchangeable. And 
I found in my lifetime that the baseline happiness is movable. From, for me, from almost one extreme to almost another extreme. Right? When, when I was young, if nothing is happening, I was miserable. And today, if nothing is happening, I'm jolly. It's a huge shift. And it was no accident. It was through training. And so uh, I wrote this book about how to do the training. And this is the book, Joy on Demand. Sorry, I, I didn't have to, to hold up like, like Vanna White. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so training, how do you do that? It turns out you can train to access joy in three simple steps. And the first step is easing into joy, easing. And this is how it works. You begin by training, no, even better than that, you begin by resting the mind, resting. And resting is an instinct. We all know how to rest, right? When we have a workout, at the end of the day, we rest. Turns out resting can also be a skill. It can also be something that you can practice so that you can be good at resting. And then when you become good at resting, your mind is at ease. And then when your mind is at ease, something happens which is you may find joy arising. Joy. Which may be surprising. For me, it was, it was like profoundly surprising. I, I discovered to my, for myself that uh, when I was able to I develop a skill to be able to rest my mind so that it's calm and clear, and to do this on demand, I found that when I do that, joy consistently, reliably arise in the mind. The mind was dominated with joy. It was fascinating. And even after I could do that reliably, I didn't know why. So I, I asked uh, one of my teachers, and he said, it's very simple. He said that joy is a default state of mind. That's all, right? So it's a default state of mind. Therefore, when you bring the mind to a calm and clear state, all you are doing is to go back to default, which is joy. No magic. That's it. That blew my mind. And, and I discovered something. I discovered that uh, in the ancient text, there's actually a technical term to describe this, uh, this mental factor. A technical term is sukha. And it is, uh, sukha is like, uh, de depending on translation, the context sometimes translated as happiness, bliss, contentment. Uh, the, the most technical translation I've come across is non-energetic joy. It's a joy that doesn't require energy. And one way to describe it uh, in the ancient text is that it's like the air conditioning. No, just kidding. That's not, that was ancient text did not describe air conditioning. Oh, by the way, uh, anybody Buddhist around here? Okay, a, a couple. I'm going to tell a Buddhist joke. I, I know the Buddhists, they take, they take three refuges. I'm, I, I'm such a lousy Buddhist, I have to take four refuges. I take refuge in Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, and air conditioning. <laughs> 33% more refuge than the leading brand of Buddhists. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so it's, a, it's a the harm of the air conditioning. You find that it's always there. You miss it all the time, right? You're talking and so on. It's like you, near, you don't hear the sound of the air conditioning. However, if you do two things, the first thing is you quiet it down. Second thing is you pay attention. You find the sound of air conditioning. And then you find, wait a minute, it's always been there. And it's the same with sukha, with joy, this non-energetic joy. There are two features of, about it, because it's non-energetic. The first feature is that uh, it's extremely sustainable, because it doesn't require energy. It's always there. So once you're able to access it, you can always see it. The second thing is because it's non-energetic, it's very subtle. Like I say, it's the, the sound of air conditioning. The only way to access it is by quieting and paying attention. Otherwise, you'll miss it. And the corollary of that is that once you develop a skill to access sukha, then you have a highly reliable source of joy that you can access anytime. It's always there. And once that happens, uh, my blow. It's, it's life changing. It's life changing on a couple of levels. The first level that is life changing is that you know we we spend our life pursuing happiness, but it's even in the constitution. And then once you're able to access sukha, you find out something. You find out that 
happiness has always been there. Happiness is not something you pursue. Happiness is something you allow. Just by sitting, allowing to be there, it's there. Like, mind-blowing, right? And, and for me, the implication of that is that I'm no longer a slave to the pursuit of happiness. I'm now free to do whatever I need to do. And so that sort of changed my life. And uh, it also has the effect of raising happiness baseline. Right? Uh, because there's always a, a joy to be accessed. And then there's another implication, which is, I think, even more profound than what I just said, which is that this source of joy, enab joy enables you to be joyful independent of sense pleasure and ego pleasure. I think a lot of us grow up having this belief that in order to be happy, we need to one of, one of two things or both, which is we need pleasant sensations or we need pleasant ego. Right? Pleasant sensation is good taste, uh, good feeling in the body, uh, good sights and everything. Uh, pleasantness of ego, people praise us, people say they like us, they will look up to us, get promotions. Right? So the corollary of that is that therefore, if that is true, then in the absence of pleasant sensation and pleasant ego, there is no joy. Therefore, to be happy is hard because you keep having to create and or pursue pleasant senses, pleasant ego. And then once you're able to access the joy that's always been there in the mind, that breaks. And that breaks in the way, in the, the way I experience it is that if I'm having, eating chocolate, I'm joyful. If I'm sitting there not eating chocolate, I'm just sitting there. I'm also joyful. Right? So that, again, changes everything. And I, I'm going to repeat that because that's important. Joy independent of sense pleasure and ego pleasure. That's the baseline. Oh, you want to take a seat? Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, where was I? Oh, joy. Okay. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> forgot to be happy. <laughs> so the practice in step one is this. You start, you start with easing. So once you ease the mind, and then in, in, the, in the mind at rest, in the mind at ease, you allow joy to arise. And then pay attention to the joy, and then allowing the joy to reinforce the ease. Right? Because when the mind is is joyful in a very subtle way, in a very uh, calm, quiet way, is also calming. There's a calming effect. So use that to reinforce the ease, and then use the ease again to reinforce the joy. And then it becomes a virtuous cycle. And the more you do that, the, the stronger the cycle becomes. And then you end up with, with a, again, it's a skill. Right? The more you do it, the more skillful you become. And then you end up with the ability to just drop into ease and joy on demand. Powerful stuff. Right. Uh, shall we try? Shall we try a little bit of that? Okay. Uh, I'm going to. Okay. Let's let's do something very 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 easy. One breath. For one breath, I like you to do this. I like you to bring full attention to the breath. Uh, gentle, but total attention to the breath. One in breath and one out breath. Sounds good. Okay. Beginning now. Thank you. I know this is Berkeley, so you're more advanced in, in this than, than most audiences. <laughs> most audiences are, what, what do I do? <laughs> uh, let, let me do a survey. Uh, how many of you uh, feel a little bit calmer, uh, at least a little bit calmer after the breath? Let's show our hands. Yeah, see the Berkeley crowd, it's like everybody. It's like, it's like, not really, really. <laughs> another crowd will be like 70 or 70%. But this is, Berkeley is almost everybody. So one question, it leads to a question. Why does it work so well? Like it's only one breath. How does one breath work so well? It's very simple. There are two reasons. The first reason is physiological, which is that when you're bringing full attention to the breath, what happens? You notice <coughs> that naturally, somehow, your breath becomes slower and deeper. Right? You notice that. And when that happens, you're stimulating your vagus nerve. And when you're stimulating your vagus nerve, you are initiating something called the relaxation response 
which is the direct opposite of the stress response. So you're basically unstressing, like the reverse of stress. Your heart rate goes down, your blood pressure goes down, your muscle tension is reduced in one breath. I mean, it doesn't fully, but you already, you begin. That's the uh, physiological reason. Psychologically, it's even more powerful. Psychologically, to be regretful, you need to be in the past. To worry, you need to be in the future. When you are bringing full attention to the breath, then for the duration of one breath, you are in the present. Therefore, for the duration of one breath, you are free from worry and regret. Freedom from worry and regret. How amazing that is. And that is why in one breath, you feel more rested. Imagine being able to do this for more than one breath. Three breaths, five breaths, ten breaths, an hour. Freedom from worry and regret. Even one breath alone, like, it's like, I mean, for those of you uh, who have a stressful life or your managers or something, they're carrying worry and regret all the time, or business owners. Carrying worry and regret all the time. Imagine being able to let it go even for one breath, then bring it back up. That allows your body and mind to rest. So how powerful is this? Uh, I, I read a, a research study a couple of years ago, which blew my mind. And the study was on uh, tennis players, the best tennis players in the world. So the question is, is, what distinguishes the best tennis players in the world? Those who win the Wimbledon and so on. Turns out, they have one, one very important skill, which is between points, so that 10, 15 seconds between points, they're able to rest their body and mind in such a way that they're much more rested at the end of the 10 seconds than at the beginning. In 10 seconds, 15 seconds, they can rest body and mind. And because of that, they can sustain high performance. And because of that, they win. And so I, I read that research. I was fascinated. I, I talk about this in my talks a lot. But I never had a chance to, to verify it because I didn't, I didn't know any world-class tennis players. And then I met this guy. Uh, his name is Novak. And uh, by reputation, he is, I don't know, the best player in the, in the history of the game or something. <laughs> so I, I asked Novak, is this true? For you, and I mean, generally, is this true in general? And it's true for you. And he said, yes, it is true. And he says, Novak says, he said, at his level, tennis is no longer a physical game. Tennis is a mental game, right? And the ability to rest body and mind and the ability to keep calm is how he keeps winning. And then later on, I found out that he's a meditator. Right? He didn't say it at the time. So for those of you who aspire to be the best tennis player in the history of the game, you know, you know what to do now. <laughs> so this it's, it's a very powerful effect. I mean, it is good for your body and mind, it's good for your soul, and it turns out it also helps you to become successful. And that's only step one. Right? So this exercise you did, resting the mind, if you do this a lot, it, it turns into a skill, and it is life-changing. So homework, let me see. I'm trying, to assign, I'm trying to remember what the homework is. Okay. <laughs> homework is, is waiting. Every time you have to wait for anything, take one conscious breath. Sounds good? Yeah, yeah it's easy, right? So uh, uh, traffic light, uh, DMV, or waiting, to, waiting for coming, or waiting for, for me to appear. <laughs> Let's take conscious breaths. Um, so, so first it's good for you, right? Because you, you're getting the training in resting the mind and assessing joy. And, and there's, there's an, a side effect which for me was surprising, which is if you do this enough, you will never be bored again for the rest of your life. <laughs> because every time you're bored, you say, wait, this is an opportunity to take my full, my full breath. No boredom, ever. <laughs> Sounds good? Okay. okay, can I give you a second homework? Uh, second homework, uh, one breath a day for the rest of your life. That's all I ask. One a day for the rest of your life. That's all I ask. <laughs> Sounds good? Okay, yeah. pinky swear? <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> so that's only step one. Step two is inclining the mind toward joy. Inclining the mind. The word inclination is very interesting. In, in the old ancient Buddhist text, the word inclination of mind, inclination of mind is, is compared to the inclination or slope of a mountain. 
when a mountain is, is sloped in a certain way, water, when water flows, it flows effortlessly in that direction. So the key word here is effortless. When the mind is inclined in a certain way, mental factors, mental experiences flow effortlessly in that direction. For example, if your mind is inclined towards anger, every other thing makes you angry effortlessly. But if your mind is inclined towards kindness, every other thing is an excuse to be kind. And it's the same with joy. The mind can be inclined towards joy. And when that happens, effortlessly, the mind flows towards joy. It's joyful, like some large percentage of the time. Maybe not all the time, but by inclination. Because you're angry, you're angry all the time, right? But by inclination, you are joyful a lot. And the key word is effortlessly. Question is how? Uh, the, one of the key parts, there are a couple of points in the training, but I'll tell you the, key, the most important one. The most important part of this training of inclining, inclining the mind towards joy is to pay attention to thin slices of joy in daily life. Thin slices of joy. So what does that mean? Uh, in, in life, we find that there are moments of subtle joy all the time. For example, if I'm, if I'm speaking for a long time and I'm thirsty, oh, that was nice, <laughs> right? And I'm sure you have the experience. I'm sure you drink water at least once a day. And I'll show you the same experience. When you're hungry, the first bite, oh, that's delicious, right? Uh, when you meet a friend, so, hey, right, that moment, like, how are you doing, man? Right, that's joy. However, you find that each of these moments of joy <coughs> is uh, very subtle and it lasts only for a few seconds. Therefore, they're thin in both space and time. And because they're thin in space and time, we don't notice them at all. So the practice is simply to notice thin slices of joy. That is all. And when you, keep, when you notice, what happens? If we're going to play a game now, uh, let's, say, let's say we play a game. We go out and count number, count number of blue cars, and whoever counts the highest number of blue cars wins a prize. Uh, by the way, you want to know what prize you're winning? So at first I was going to give you a bell, but then I was thinking, no bell, please. So you're going to win a no bell, please prize. Ah, ah, ah. It was okay, uh, blue cars. <laughs> so if you, if you play the game, right, count, count number of blue cars on the street, you find that every time you're in traffic, you find that blue cars are everywhere. You just never notice them. And so first thing you notice, they're everywhere. Second thing is if you play the game long enough, you play for one week, even after the game stops, you notice that they're there all the, everywhere. The blue cars are everywhere, right? Same thing here. If you notice thin slices of joy, and not just notice, you pay attention to it. Attend to thin slices of joy. First thing you find, they're everywhere. Second thing, you find that you enjoy them more just because you're paying attention to them. Like previously, you were like eating, right? Now it's like at least the first part, ooh, delicious. Right? So you enjoy it a little bit more. I mean, I won't say a little bit, like twice as much. Yeah, with no difference, everything else stays the same. It doesn't take extra time, doesn't take extra effort already you feel happier. And uh, more importantly, uh, there's momentum. Right? So even when you're not consciously doing it, because you've been attending to it, the momentum follows and you still notice them. And even more important, I think this is the crux of it, the most important part is that once you do this a lot, you become familiar with joy. So the key word in this training is familiarization. And the thing about the word familiar in English is that it is uh, it's very closely related to the word family. Right? So to become familiar, or for the mind to become familiar with joy, it means that joy becomes a member of family. Joy becomes like a best friend. Somebody we can rely on, somebody who's there for you all the time. Somebody you can call on at any moment. Joy becomes that. So just by noticing, attending, you become familiarized. And by becoming familiarized, you develop an inclination of mind. And once a mind is inclined, 
then you have effortless access to joy. Fascinating stuff, right? Okay. Shall we do an exercise? Okay. Uh, so, so now you're, you're experienced. You've done the one. You've done the one breath. Uh, and because you are Berkeley uh, folks, so I'm going to make you, give you a challenge. So this is this is an extra long meditation. I hope you don't mind. You're going to do three breaths. <laughs> and here's what I want you to do. Uh, for the first breath, same thing as before. I'm going to call it collecting attention, which is you bring full attention, total but gentle attention to one breath. The second thing, uh, second breath, sorry, second breath is you calm the body, whatever those words mean to you, calm the body. And the third breath, bring up joy. And if you have problem doing that, if you don't know what that means, try this. Try smiling. Half smile or full smile, whichever, whatever those words mean to you. And the reason is because the face, facial expression reflects your emotional state and also feeds back to emotional state. So just by smiling, you, you'll become a little bit happier. Sounds good? Okay. Shall we begin? Let's begin now. First breath, collecting attention. Second breath, calming the body. The breath, bringing up joy. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How many of you feel a little bit more joyful than before? Okay, good. Practically everybody. <laughs> well done. <laughs> uh, you might ask, why is this so effective? We need three things. Uh, the first, collecting attention. Right? Coming the body, bringing up joy. It turns out that each of the three is by itself conducive to joy. Remember the first exercise we did, the first one? Already it's a little bit pleasant, a bit, a little bit joyful. So because each of the three is by itself conducive to joy, you put them together. It's very powerful. And if you do that a lot, I mean, if you do this, you have, with enough practice, anytime you can do this, you have access to joy. And if you bring a lot of attention to it, something else happens, which is, um, or maybe I tell a story. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm debating myself whether I tell a story now or a bit later. I'll tell a story now. Uh, I, I was, I was uh, leading, I was speaking to the audience like this, and then in the audience was this guy called Matthew Ricard. Uh, somebody might have heard of him. He's a monk. He's been, he has 60,000 hours of meditation experience. And uh, I let one of these 10 second 10, 10 second things, and he was in the audience, he was thinking to himself, this can't work, right? Because, because if, if 10 seconds work, like, why did I spend 60,000 hours on it? <laughs> <laughs> and then he did it anyway. And then he was like, oh my God, it worked. And so it surprised even him. Right? And then later on, he came to me and he said he figured out what happened. Uh, and he said, uh, it's something he already knew, but he kind of forgotten, which was something in the Tibetan, uh, there's a Tibetan analogy in the old scriptures, which is if you bring high intensity of attention to the practice. So remember I gave the instruction, total but gentle attention to one breath. You put a lot of intensity. It is like having very strong perfume. So the energy, if you have very strong perfume, you open it just for a few seconds, you close it back, even for just a few seconds. Your room will smell nice for, for like many minutes. Right? So it's an intensity. So same thing, if you calm the mind intensely, even for a few seconds your calmness will last for at least a few minutes. So the intensity is important. Uh, where was I? I was talking, yeah, see, the problem with telling, telling stories is I forget what I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so you did three things. Each one is conducive to joy. Uh, the breath thing, uh, yeah, sorry, I forgot what I was going to say. Blue cars. Blue cars. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, yeah, anyway, so this, this practice, do this a lot, right? And then you have access to joy any time of the day. Um, what else hap happens after that? Um, if you do this a lot, okay, sorry, let me, let me say that uh, later on because I, I've, 
I want to assign homework first. Homework, uh, eating and drinking. Yeah. So every time you eat, at the very, the very first bite, bring full attention to the taste, and not just the taste, the joy of the experience. Right. So again, why? To familiarize the mind with joy. And even if you're, even you're eating with a friend, even if the conversation is okay, because it's only the first bite. It's only a few seconds. Easy? Uh, drinking water, same thing. The first one or two seconds. Oh, no more thirst. This, um, this is beautiful. Uh, meeting a friend, same thing. First moment. Bring attention to the joy. I haven't seen you in a long time. Yeah. See, that moment. Right? Didn't, didn't, I mean, nothing changed. Right? Didn't take any extra time. Uh, shower. First moment of water. So any pleasant experience, bring attention to the joy of that thin slice of joy. All right. Sounds good? Okay, that was your homework. That's step two. Step three is to uplift the mind with what we call the heart practices. So what are the heart practices? Loving kindness, compassion, and altruistic joy. These are the heart practices. And uh, same as before, uh, another virtual cycle, which is to first to, to bring up or to experience the, 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 uh, the, the status, the state, the mental state involved in kindness, compassion, generosity, altruism, whatever it is. And then, if joy arises, bring full attention to the joy. And then the joy will reinforce that mental state. And then let the mental state reinforce the joy. And it becomes a virtuous cycle. And one of the most important things about this cycle is that eventually, if you do this enough, goodness and joy become one. You become joyful to be good. And that's important because if the previous, previous thing, uh, we talked about inclining the mind towards joy. If you do that, one of the effects is you start noticing not just the presence, but the absence of pain. And then also you notice, uh, because you notice absence of pain, you notice something called the joy of blamelessness, which is when you have a clear conscience, you start to say, this is a joyful state. It's not a neutral state, it's a joyful state. It's joyful to do the right thing. So you combine, so you combine the joy of blamelessness and, and the joy of uh, kindness and generosity and compassion, joy of goodness, you put it together. What does this mean? This means that you never have to talk about ethics again for the rest of your life. Because that is ethics, right? If you're, if you're joyful being good, if you're joyful to be free from blame, then you always do the right thing. Right? There's no more discussion needed about what is ethical and what is not. So, uh, uplifting the mind. Shall we try a, a practice? Again, 10 seconds, very quick. So, uh, I want you to identify secretly, identify two people in this room, and then just think, I wish for this person to be happy, and I wish for that person to be happy. Let's think. Don't do anything. Don't say anything. Don't go like, oh. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> just think. It's an entirely thinking exercise. Sounds good? Okay, 10 seconds. Thank you. You notice you are happier already? Right? You notice that to be on the giving end of a kind thought is in itself intrinsically rewarding. And again, it took no time. Right? And if that was true, then my friends, this is a highly reliable source of happiness. Just by thinking, I wish for that guy to be happy, that alone makes you happy. And if you do that a lot, what happens? It becomes a mental habit. Right? You see random people, and the first thought is, I wish for this person to be happy. As a first thought. Why? Because it is a habit. No other reason than because it's a habit. And then habit becomes personality. Personality becomes character. Character becomes you. So by just having a habit, by doing something often enough, thinking often enough, it, you become a kind person. 
you can change just by having this thought. The other point that blew my mind was how powerful this experience was. By the way, it surprised me. And so this is what happened. I was speaking uh, in, on a Monday evening. So uh, Jack Confield uh, in, in Spirit Rock, near to here, he has a Monday class. Right? So Jack invited me to, to speak in one of, the, one of those Mondays, so I, I went. And so I, we did this, and I signed homework. The homework is, uh, I say tomorrow, Tuesday. Tomorrow is a work day. So try this. Every hour, spend 10 seconds wishing for two people to be happy outside your office, in your head. So it's not embarrassing, right? Because nobody knows you're thinking. Just don't go like, uh, right? <laughs> no, so just think. And don't go like, no. <laughs> not embarrassing, right? And then go back to work. Nothing changed. Only 10 seconds. See what happens. Uh, so I say, eight, one hour, uh, eight, eight hours of work, one hour. Every hour, 10 seconds. Try it. So that was Monday night. Wednesday morning, I received an email from a total stranger. And this person say, I hate my job. I hate coming to work every single day. However, I did the homework on Tuesday, and Tuesday was my happiest day in seven years. Happiest day in seven years. What did it take? It took 80 seconds of thinking. And the best thing is that every adult I've ever met in my life knows how to bring up a thought. So all you have to do is to bring up a thought for 80 seconds. And that could be the happiest day in seven years. Right? Mind-blowing, right? Shall we try another ex exercise? So, so now we're now we getting to know each other. Now we're all experts. This is a long form exercise. Uh, this will be quite long. Uh, this will be 30 seconds. <laughs> I'd like you to do this. I'd like you to uh, bring to mind somebody you care about. Maybe somebody in this room, maybe it doesn't have to be. Somebody you care about, wish for that person to be happy. And then if joy arises, Bring attention to that joy until it fades away. That's all. And then when it fades away, just sit there and relax for 30 seconds. Shall we try that? Okay, beginning now. Bring to mind somebody you care about. Wish, I wish for this person to be happy. And if any joy arises, just bring attention to it. Thank you, my friends. Thank you for your attention. You like this exercise? Yeah, okay. So this is the long form uh, of, of the loving kindness exercise. Uh, the, the, the short form was, was what we did earlier, which is wish for people to be happy randomly. The long form is not just wishing that, also, more importantly, paying attention to the joy. Why? Same thing. To familiarize the mind with the joy of goodness. And then letting that joy reinforce the mental state, the goodness state, which reinforce the behavior. And then it goes, again, it's a cycle. And then eventually, you reach a point where goodness and joy are one. So these are the three steps. Uh, for those of you who didn't take notes, uh, uh, you can buy the book, right? <laughs> <laughs> for sale in all good, all good bookstores. Um, easing into joy. Inclining to what joy and uplifting the mind with goodness. Okay, these three steps. If you do these three, what happens? Three things happen. The first thing that happens is that you find that joyful experiences become even more joyful. For the simple reason that you're paying attention to it. And again, it doesn't cost you anything. Right? Nothing, nothing changes at all. All you do is pay more attention and you double your joy. Right? This is the best deal, like the be best deal on earth, <laughs> right? the best deal on TV, <laughs> and, and, and free shipping and handling. <laughs> the second thing that happens is that new true experiences become joyful. And the reason for that is that we stop taking them for granted. <laughs> so I'll give you two examples. One example is uh, freedom from pain. When, when I have a toothache, 
I tell myself, if I don't have this pain, I'll be so happy. Right? And I went to see a dentist. I got this taken care of. And then, after three days, I forget to be happy. And for, in my case, it happened again. Same tooth. Uh, the, the, the feeling broke. It sunk into my gum. If I didn't spit, I'd be so happy. Right. Went to the dentist, took care of it. Three days later, I forgot. And then, happened again, by the way. <laughs> so the first time it broke, the second time it sunk in. Same thing. See the dentist, three days later, I forgot to be happy. And then it occurs to me, uh, if, I mean, freedom from pain is such a wonderful thing. It's such a joyful thing. And yet, I keep forgetting to be happy. If I remember to be happy, then I'll always be joyful. So, questions for an engineer. The questions are why and how. And I, I kind of figured it out. Oh, by the way, uh, so how did I get to that point? Uh, I reached a tipping point. The tipping point was I kept practicing the, the inclining the mind towards joy, as we did earlier. And then one day, it just happened. One day, I was drinking water. I was literally drinking water, and it just occurred to me. This moment right here, right now, I'm not in physical pain. I don't have pain in my tooth. I don't have pain in my back. I don't have this pain. And I'm not in mental pain. I'm not, I'm not suffering from jealousy. I'm not suffering from anger. Not, no hatred. Nothing at that moment. I said, oh my God, I'm so happy right now. Dude, I'm just getting water. <laughs> right. so, so that was my tipping point. And then I realized that, wait a minute. Why don't I feel this way all the time? And I, I think I, I know the answer. The answer was this. If we have a stimulus-led uh, uh, experience, so let's say uh, uh, from a sense, like a sight, or a, a, hear, uh, a, a sound, a taste, or whatever, what happens is then you will lead to contact with sense object and sense organ. Contact leads to sensation. Sensation leads to perception. Perception leads to, leads to proliferation of mental activity. In other words, through stimulus, the mind is invited to participate. Lacking stimulus, this chain doesn't happen. Therefore, lacking stimulus, the mind doesn't participate. And therefore, that's why we don't notice the absence of phenomena. We only notice presence of phenomena. So that's the why. The question is how. How do I solve that? Turns out it's very easy. The way to solve it is through, a, again, a mental habit, which is every now and then just, just look at myself and say, am I in pain right now? No. I'm so happy, <laughs> right? And then just do that a lot, it becomes a habit. And every now and then, as you walk by your normal life, just taking a walk, I'm not in pain right now, woohoo, right? <laughs> At least once a day, that happens. So that's why neutral experiences become, uh, uh, become positive. There's something else that happens, by the way, if you do that, you, you, which is uh, a gratitude. So, so the logical, uh, if you do that, the logical conclusion of that is that you find that every experience is a miracle, right? Uh, I mean, some of you go to church. Some, there are some miracle churches where you walk in, the, you go in a wheelchair, and then you stand up, and then like, oh my God, she can walk! Hallelujah! It's a miracle. However, most of us in this room can walk. How often do I say, I can walk? Hallelujah. Same thing, right? Seeing, oh my God, she can, she can see! Hallelujah. We can all see. How many of you say, I can see? Hallelujah. And so, so if you have this practice, suddenly you notice that every experience in life is worth saying hallelujah to. I can see. I can walk. I can think. I have friends. Right? I have a job. I have air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, that happens. Again, through this training, again, effortlessly, through inclining your mind, the mind effortlessly becomes like that. So that's the second thing that happens. The third thing that happens is that uh, painful experiences become less painful. At the very least, you learn to be able to deal with them. Uh, and there are a couple of ways that happens. The first way is that those same practices we use for increasing joy or accessing joy also helps us to deal with pain. For example, calming the mind, resting the mind. It causes joy. At the same time, if you're in a difficult situation, you're in painful, emotionally painful situation, calm the mind. Do that. Half the pain is gone in that moment. And of course, you deal with the other half, but half of it is there. Begin to solve the problem. Right? So, so all the 
everything, loving kindness. In pain, in difficulty, dealing with a difficult person, kindness, compassion. Uh, the, 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 the comparison is this. The comparison is you go to the gym a lot. You go to the gym just to look good, right? However, I mean, you're not muscles, you look good. However, then if you're falling off a ravine in times of emergency, you can hold on, you can pull yourself out. So you go to the gym to look good, but the same skill set allows you to get out of a difficult situation. Same thing here. You practice this for joy, but the same skill set allows you to deal with pain. So that's the first uh, uh, reason. The second reason it works is because it raises your happiness baseline. Uh, in my case, by a lot. So the comparison is, is that assume, let's pretend that you are not very rich. Right? And then all your, all your income is not very low. Uh, not, income not very high. And then for whatever reason, you have to lose $100,000, medical bill or something. And then that's a, that's a lot of money. Right? That's a huge hit. However, if you have a lot of money and all your high income, you say, yeah, 100000 I can make it back in a year. I can, I, can, I can take it. Same thing here. If you have very high level of joy and you can bring in high level of joy, then the shit in life, you can just take care of it because you have so much resources to deal with all the shit. Right? That's the second thing. The third reason, I think even more powerful than the first two, is that you may find through this practice that the access to joy happens, if, you, if enough practice, it happens also in the midst of pain. And, and for me, my, the way I experienced it was I find that I'm, when I'm in that deep pain, prolonged deep pain, some, sometimes, out of nowhere, I have moments, sometimes minutes, of unadulterated pure joy. Like, be, like one moment I want to die. And then I pure joy. I don't want to die again. Right? It's like, like whoa, where, did that, where did that come from? I must be going crazy. <laughs> uh, more crazy than I already am, I mean. <laughs> That's what I thought. I, I really thought I was going crazy. And as, as an engineer, the question I ask myself is this. If I have access to joy, why can't the joy displace or, or dissolve the pain? If I have the pain, why can't the pain dissolve the joy? Like it, can't, it doesn't make sense. And I figured it out. I think the reason is that pain and joy are mutually uh, non -dis doesn't dissolve each other. Mutually non-dissolvable. So therefore, they can exist side by side. And if one is much stronger than the other, they can displace the other. So if a very happy and a little bit of pain, yeah, whatever, that displaces it. But, some, but, but they are, if they're both strong, then they don't displace each other. They exist side by side. So that's, that's what I found out. That was a, it's, it's a, to me one of those mind-blowing findings. The corollary or the implication of this finding is that therefore, joy can be used as a skillful way to deal with pain. Uh, especially as a skillful container. So, uh, for me, the moment I realized this was when I met this person called Rigobota Manchu. Uh, she's a Nobel Peace Laureate. She's, a, she's the only Mayan woman ever to win a Nobel Peace Prize. And I don't know if any of you have met a Nobel Peace Prize winner. Uh, I met a few, <laughs> like 10. And, and there's a stereotype, by the way, and the stereotype is true. Uh, I mean, there, are, there are exceptions. I won't say who they are. But, uh, stereotypically, you see one of those people, they're they always very nice to you. They're joyful. They go, hey, how are you doing? Uh, they're warm, joyful, kind, everything. Like, all the good qualities you can think of, they have it. And for the, so I met Rigoberta, uh, same thing, stereotypical. Right? Wonderful human being, very happy. And, but in her case, I just had to go know her for a very little amount of time, like an hour or so. And I realized that her pain, she has, she has immense amount of pain she's holding. And the pain is just right under the surface. It doesn't scratch very deeply, it's just there. And uh, for good reasons. So I, I learned later about her life story. Uh, her father was burned alive. Yeah. Her mom was kidnapped, tortured, raped, murdered, and left on the street to rot. Horrible, right? Her brother suffered a similar fate. She lost a son. I mean, any one of those events is traumatic. I mean, she suffered the whole thing. 
and she's a Nobel Prize winner. So she, she went through, she had to lead her people, despite all that. By the way, every Nobel Prize winner, Peace Prize winner you see, they have some trauma. It's not easy to win a Nobel Peace Prize. So, so she went through all that. And so the question is, how do I account for this? How do I account for all the pain and all the joy in one person, all the time? And I realized that the way she, she does it is she's using her joy as a skillful container. And the, the comparison is that if you have a fracture, a very serious fracture, you have a cast around it. And the cast will limit the damage and allow it to heal over time. So by containing the pain with joy, she's allowing it to not cause more damage and she's allowing it to heal on her own. Right, so it's a beautiful, powerful lesson. And the way I experience it is the ability to access joy intermittently in pain is like oasis. So it's like, it's like going to a vast desert, it's a horrible desert, but the oasis, and the oasis allows me to survive the, the trip from one side of the desert to the other. And so this, this ability to access joy was for me, I mean, I, I started thinking it was only to be happy. I, learn that, not just that, more importantly, it helps you deal with suffering. And eventually it helps you overcome suffering. Let me check the time. Okay, I want to leave time for questions. So I'll just, I'll, I had a whole section, I'll just skip that. I, this, I'll tell you a section, the section is about, about success. I, and, but this is Berkeley, nobody cares about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'll finish and then I'll Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I have one last thing. Uh, so, I hope that to, to this book, uh, my purpose for writing this book is, is this. I, I want to, how should I say it? So, so that I want to create a condition for world peace in my lifetime. That's my goal in life. Conditions for world peace in my lifetime. And I thought the way to do that is what will trigger world peace? I think what will trigger it is global compassion. Compassion on a global scale. That will trigger world peace. The way, the, however, compassion has to be sustained by inner joy. Inner joy has to be sustained by inner peace. And there's feedback loop, feedback loop, right? Which is joy and compassion form a virtuous cycle. Joy and peace form a virtuous cycle. And so I wrote a book ostensibly about joy, but it is actually about the whole package, peace, joy, compassion. And through do, doing this, through writing this book, I hope that it's not just to heal an individual person. I hope that's for healing the world. I hope that I'm making this, I'm making peace, joy, compassion widely understandable, widely accessible, but more importantly, no, most importantly, widely practiced. I hope that everybody will practice peace, joy, and compassion. And I hope that together, we will create the conditions for world peace in our lifetime. Thank you. Thank you. I have half an hour for questions. Okay, ask me anything embarrassing. Yes, sir. Oh, the title is Joy on Demand. Yeah, the, the, the publishers imposed it on me. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, that reminds me of, of an analogy in the ancient text, which is that uh, somebody who's strong in loving kindness is compared to some a trumpeter who is blowing his trumpet very loudly. So people around him can hear the trumpet, effort, trumpet effortlessly. In the same way, a person who is strong in loving kindness, his, his loving kindness spread effortlessly. And people around him can just, can just feel it. So, thank you. Yes, ma'am. First, I retired from Google. Uh, I retired since since uh, out November. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I know I'm, I'm a big boy now. <laughs> um, so uh, answer is yes. Uh, the the way it works in Google is we have a very strong culture of meditation. It's all optional, by the way. Nobody's being forced to do that. Uh, but we have we have meditation rooms everywhere. We have people leading uh, uh, classes. It's called G pause, right? So there are people who. Uh, 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 what do you call it? Lead classes every lead sittings every week. Uh, there are a couple of classes on meditation. There are short ones. Uh, one called hacking. I think it's called neural self hacking. Yeah, it's, it's targeted for engineers. Right? They like the language. And the the course that the course that I was responsible for creating, uh, search inside yourself. It is uh, it's fairly complete. So it's not just mindfulness. It is also emotional intelligence. Using mindfulness to train emotional intelligence. And because it's emotional intelligence, it also includes uh, intra interpersonal intelligence. And because it also interpersonal intelligence, there is kindness and compassion in the curriculum. And so, uh, search inside yourself, as I why, has become even even before way before I left Google, it was the number one most popular class in Google. Uh, the wait list is always very long. And uh, I tell you a story. I, I only found this out. From somebody who was angry at me, <laughs> which is uh, there was a time when when I was running it, uh, the class every time I open the class, the class gets fills up in thirty seconds. <laughs> and and the way it worked was that uh, they, they tell me right, they say they're in a meeting in a meeting room, people have their laptops on, and then somebody just suddenly say class is open, and everybody knows what they mean. They all go in and lock in and try to, and half the people in the room will not be able to sign up. Because thirty seconds is over, right? So yeah, so some people got very angry at me, <laughs> and then uh, so I uh, uh, the the Bill, the guy who took over me, he very capable. He expanded the number of seats by factor of ten, so we ended up having um, we say we I say him, yeah, he, people other people do all my real work, so so Bill started a class for training teachers, so we're ten times more capacity today, so even that the wait list is like a thousand or something. Uh, so it's, it's going really well. Uh, people say it changed their lives. I get testimonial a lot. One, one of the most, the one that touched me the most, is this person say, she, he say, I now see myself and other people with kindness. That's huge, right? Uh, and so because of the success, not because of that, I mean, I've always wanted to do this from day one, when I created Search Inside Yourself, to bring it outside of Google to the world. So I started an institute in, in the Presidio called the Search Inside Yourself Leadership Institute. S-I-Y-L-Y, pronounced as silly. <laughs> Silly.org. And uh, so silly has been bringing this outside the world with the blessing of Google, and Google donated all the IP. And uh, the other, we have other now other companies, uh, SAP, for example. It's, it's a German company, uh, and German engineers, and they love it. So it's becoming very popular in SAP, and also now it's spreading to other companies. Uh, and Silly is also running a class on joy. I, I haven't created it yet, but I'm supposed to. <laughs> and, and for those interested, silly.org slash joy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, in connection to your question, yes. Uh, or better, better than that, <laughs> they train, they train a, an actually certified teacher. <laughs> so, uh, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the scene, uh, uh, the, the most senior teachers we have are Norman Fisher, who is a Zen master in San Francisco Zen Center, and, and Meg Levy, who is also another Zen master. So they have been responsible for training teachers. And uh, for me, uh, I, I want the word Google certified to be, to be the equivalent of, 
of, I don't know, of Ranger School, right? It's like if you go to Ranger School, you know they're the best of the best. And I want that same thing. So, so the teachers that we, we have, they have at least 2,000 hours of practice in their lifetime. Uh, they have a daily practice and uh, they, they have, for example, able to like, bring their mind to calmness on demand, uh, bring about method, uh, compassion on demand, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I tell you something else, which is I'm, I'm actually an accidental teacher. Yeah. So uh, when I created Search Inside Yourself, I wasn't prepared to teach. And I not just wasn't prepared, I was unqualified. I still am. <laughs> I was unqualified to teach. And so, so uh, what happened was, uh, in, remember 2008? There was like a, I don't know, a crisis in the world. <laughs> and, and then uh, Google reacted with, with like uh, massive budget cuts to the training budget. Uh, and so, so uh, the head of Google University told me in no uncertain terms that if I wasn't teaching this, the class is going away. But I said, but, but I'm not qualified. And he said, yes, and <laughs> you're not teaching it, it's going away. <laughs> Which is what caused, caused me to start teaching it. Turns out I didn't suck as, as much as I thought I would. <laughs> and because of that, I wrote a book. And, because, and everything was history. It was fa like fascinating. Yeah. I still feel unqualified, but at least we have a book. Okay, uh, that gentleman. Not necessarily advice. Um, so it's, it's a question I've been asking myself, and there's a, there's a similar question, which is why do I eat so much junk food? And the answer is because I can. <laughs> and the same thing, why do I consume so much junk information? Right? Because I can. And so, uh, so first, the problem, I would say the problem ha has been around for a very long time. And, and in the old days before we had this, we had newspapers. We had books, right? You see like, people like, reading the newspaper instead of talking to their partners all the time. Right? So it's not a new problem. So the solution, uh, the solution, I think, the partial solution is, first, it's, it's an awareness. What? Awareness. Specifically this. Specifically, the currency of information is attention. You need to, in order to consume information, you need to pay attention. And attention is a non-renewable res uh, resource. Right? If you, once you pay it, once you use it, it's no, you no longer have it. So, therefore, uh, abundance of information leads necessarily to the poverty of attention. Therefore, if most of the information you're consuming is junk information, that is a big price to pay. And so once you're aware of that, then if you, it looks different, the, the world looks different, then you're more conscious about consuming because there's a huge price to pay. The price to pay is attention. So that's one, the awareness. Uh, now, the second thing I think is, uh, is the joy of, of be human beings, basically. Right? So, so the reason we do this rather than this is because this is more fun than this. Right? So the solution is to find the fun in this. Yeah, that's what I think. So, yeah, loving kindness practice. Uh, this Contradictory, and so and either one or both might work for you. The f so uh, first the the, pre uh, the context. The context is don't stop your mind from thinking. It is okay to think, uh, or the joke is meditation is not what you think. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one or two ways to work with this. The, f one, the first way is to just allow the mind thinking the mind to think while you bring attention to the breath. So so the four breath becomes foreground attention. And, and movement of mind becomes a background. So in the foreground, I'm just doing this, and in the background, things are happening. Allow it to be. So that's, that's one way to do this. 
Another way to do this, which may work better, is to bring attention to the thoughts. Right? So the thought becomes foreground attention. Foreground, yeah, you look at it. Look at it intensely. See what you see, what you see in the mind, what you hear, what you taste, what, you, what does it look like. So intently bring it there, and the background attention is the breath. Uh, when I tried doing this, so, so I, had, I had this issue where I kept being distracted by thoughts, and it was very annoying. Right? And, uh, and then at different times of my progress, I had two solutions. The first, the first one was, was when I was a novice meditator, and I just stopped trying. I just, uh, so I'll tell you the full story, and then I'll tell you the second story. The, the story was I was the worst meditator in the world. I can say that as a te technic with technical certainty. Oh, I have five minutes. Okay. Uh, where was I? And, and how I couldn't breathe, right? Because I was so tense. Nobody I know have problem breathing in meditation. I had a problem. I'm literally the worst in the world. And, and so I, after trying for like weeks or months, nothing worked. So one day I just decided, I'll just stop trying. I'm just going to sit there. And then when I sat there, after 10 minutes, I realized I was breathing. And I caught myself breathing, and I noticed, wait a minute, this is the first time I, I can see myself breathing without running out of breath. And I did that by not trying. So that's, that's one way. So to not try, that could be the solution. And just seeing. Uh, the second way, uh, that thing, so that will happen in a, a little part when I was already an experienced meditator. And so I had a lot, a lot of self-blame. I said, I suck at this. I'm supposed to be good at this. And now suddenly, my thoughts keep taking me away from my breath. And so I was prescribed that method. And then when I did that, I realized something. I realized that my thoughts are very shy. When I look intensely at them, they run away. <laughs> run away, right? And, and so it became like a game. It's like I felt I was playing a bunch of kids. A bunch of kids go like, eh, and then you look at the kids, they all run away, they're laughing. It was like that. So try this. Try looking intensely at the thoughts and see if they're shy and run away. If they're shy and run away, they don't have a problem. If they don't run away, it's not a problem because they're just playing with you. So either way, try both. And the key part is equanimity. And what this practice allows you to do is to practice equanimity. Okay, I think I have time for one last question. Okay. I don't know who raised their hand. I think we did. So I'm just curious. I am typically a joyful person. And I find that I go sometimes through like roller coasters, like cruising, cruising, cruising. <laughs> The one breath exercise, did that work for you just now? Yeah. Well, the second, actually the second one did when I rested my body. It was a single breath no, the three breaths yes. Let's do that. There is a concept, a very important concept in medical science and not applied often enough in meditation, which is minimum effective dose. <laughs> right? There's a dosage for everybody and it's different. And uh, the dosage for meditation, it has to be just slightly more than the minimum effective dose, but not too much more. And it's possible that at your stage, 20 minutes a day is just too much. Uh, yeah, so, so that 10 breaths, whatever, 10 breaths a day could be it. Yeah, so, so try that. And then once you are comfortable with it, uh, don't stay there. Push the boundary. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think all that's, that's all the time we have, right? Okay, with that, well, thank you very much. <laughs>